Good afternoon and welcome to this second session of Orkney Aviation Festival. We're going to continue today's look into the future of aviation by finding out what may lie ahead for Air, Scotland's airline. Its story started in 1962 with and five years later it commenced its internal Orkney scheduled services which continue to be an island for the North Isles today. Over those years, the company has grown to become the UK's biggest regional airline in terms of passenger number. What, in today's uncertain times, may lie ahead for Scotland's airline? Well, Andy Smith, Head of Sustainability Strategy at Ogan Air, is with us to give an insight into the company's future development plans. Andy's career in the aviation industry has taken him across Africa and Europe, working for various airlines, particularly in the field of network planning and scheduling. So Andy, a warm welcome and it's over to you. Thanks, Howie. And thank you to Moya and John and uh, the other organisers of the Orkney Aviation Festival for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'd like to start with a, an introduction from our CEO, Jonathan Hinkles. Um, he uh, uh, isn't able to be here today, but is hugely supportive of the work that goes on and in particular our Orkney-based uh, operations. I can have the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, the presentation I'm going to give today is, is based largely on a presentation that uh, Logan and made to the uh, Citizens Climate Assembly um, at the beginning of the year, updated with some of the activities that have actually occurred during the course of this summer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, as Howie mentioned, uh, Logan Air was formed in 1962. Um, we're based in Glasgow. Um, and whilst COVID has had a significant effect on our operations, um, we still operate over 40 aircraft currently. Um, and we fly more UK domestic routes than any other airline. And we connect more remote communities than uh, every other UK airline uh, combined. Next slide, please. Um, this gives a, a simple overview of Logan Air's um, network. As you can see, we operate across the UK. Um, this pre-COVID map has, has changed a little bit since uh, we've restructured our network and adapted to the changes in demands. But we are back growing our network again, and we hope to reach back to full capacity um, quite shortly. <clears throat> 
Next slide, please. This um, map sort of explains our Scottish network, and there's a few important points I'd like to make here. Um, this is primarily in the context of trying to understand the alternative uh, travel options and their carbon intensities of travel domestically across Scotland. Um, as the slide says, all but one of our um, uh, Scottish domestic routes involves an overwater leg. So uh, direct rail services are not an option. Uh, and every journey involves either road or rail combined with uh, ferry plus onward road or rail journeys to get to its destination. This is simply a feature of Scotland's geography. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, a number of the services that Logan Air operates are public service routes operated under contracts to Transport Scotland and in the case of Orkney, the Orkney Island Council. Um, the routes there will be familiar, I'm sure, to, to most attendees of this uh, of this festival. Uh, and uh, I apologise if uh, um, I'm making dumbing things down a little bit to, to explain the different aircraft types that we operate. Um, the key thing about both the, the Britain Norman Islander, which has been operated in Orkney for nearly 60 years now by Logan Air, uh, and the uh, Twin Otter aircraft that fly out to the Western Isles, are that both of these aircraft types are of a category and size, which means they are most likely to be the types that are adapted first for genuinely net zero or zero emissions um, propulsion systems. And that's because they are smaller and lighter than, uh, than the majority of the rest of Logan Air's fleet. Next slide, please. So, the environmental issues that face our industry, they've been widely talked about in, in, in the press, um, but the, they fundamentally split into two, uh, two issues. The main one is the direct emissions of CO2 caused by burning jet fuel. Um, aircraft uh, use a fuel called Jet A1, which is um, chemically very similar to kerosene with certain additives to ensure that it stays viscous at uh, low temperatures. Um, and each tonne of kerosene that's burnt emits 3.15 tonnes of CO2, which remains in the atmosphere for about 100 years. In addition, um, the combustion of kerosene causes smaller levels of emissions of, of nitrous oxide, uh, water vapour, which is particularly important, uh, soot and sulphurous oxides. These aspects combine to cause what we call the indirect effects of CO2, of, uh, of CO2 indirect warming emissions, um, where particularly when the water vapour uh, in the jet's exhaust or the, the turbine's exhaust interacts with supersaturated um, blocks of air uh, and clouds are formed, contrails as we would call them. Next slide, please. Uh, this rather complicated uh, chart um, sort of explains our current understanding of the impact of these indirect effects. The bar at the very top of the chart shows the um, red being a um, uh, negative effect, a uh, warming effect. It shows the effect of contrails or cirrus being formed. Um, the error bars there, though, however, explain that um, our level of scientific understanding of the, these effects has quite a wide range. There is a lot of uncertainty about these, whereas if you look at the, the chart below, the direct effects of CO2 emissions, you can see there's a very high level of certainty that the warming effects of direct CO2 emissions are well understood. The various other um, emissions, as you can see, combine to form a mix of positive and slightly, uh, slightly positive primarily negative effects. But contrails are the primary um, factor and the primary cause of concern from uh, non-CO2 emissions. Now, the effects of contrails are complex to understand because their effects are short-lived, um, whereas CO2 remains in the atmosphere um, for a well-understood period of time. The effects of contrails are quite limited um, and the warming effects that they drive are complex to understand. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> typically, contrails form above flight level 250, which is 25,000 feet above sea level. Um, they um, uh, are more likely to form as the water um, vapour 
um, has uh, particles of soot or black carbon in the um, exhaust jet stream to uh, form contrails. Um, the contrails formed during the day have a combined positive and negative effect because they reflect some sunlight back out into space, whereas at night the uh, effects of contrails are entirely negative by trapping uh, warming um, close to the Earth's surface. We work with a uh, Cambridge-based uh, technology company, Statavia, and we're looking to develop their um, very accurate uh, weather forecasting and climate, climate uh, analysis systems into our flight planning so that we can uh, understand the likelihood of a given flight path uh, generating a contrail um, and consequently take avoiding action. And often the uh, adjustment is only a matter of uh, adjusting the cruise altitude by uh, several thousand feet. Um, that will generally allow us to reduce the likelihood of uh, a contrail being formed. Next slide, please. Uh, this table very simply summarizes the difference between the direct and indirect impacts. The direct impacts are well understood. There's high levels of confidence uh, of, of the effects that uh, the CO2 emissions cause. Um, and it's well quantified by the IPCC and uh, under the EU ETS, now to be UK ETS schemes, we have a clear understanding of um, what factors of carbon are caused directly by burning a ton of kerosene. The indirect um, climate impacts are less well understood. And the principal concern is that whilst um, uh, most industry players understand that it is a, a generally negative effect, the range of uncertainty is so high that it makes it very difficult to form policy around it. Um, and we really need that uncertainty to be reduced. Um, one of our um, asks to the UK government in a recent round of consultations is that the government enables more academic study into this so that we can understand the effects better and that will better enable us to do something about it. Clearly, if we choose to cruise at any altitude that is not the optimal one, we will ultimately be causing slightly greater direct carbon effects in order to mitigate the indirect effects. And we need to be really clear that that is the uh, optimal environmental choice to make uh, as part of our planning processes. But to do that, we need greater certainty as to what the effects are and how they work. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so why haven't we fixed the environmental issues caused by aviation, given the large uh, public interest uh, and governmental interest in this problem? Firstly, the scale of the problem for the industry as a whole is huge. The amount of carbon that we emit and the amount of fuel that is used by the global industry, which I'll come on to later, is significant. The technical alternatives to jet fuel are not yet ready. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about uh, bio-based sustainable aviation fuels, which are a solution that are emerging into the market now, um, but at very limited volumes. But the uh, really uh, genuinely zero emission fuels or energy sources such as hydrogen fuels or battery electric fuels are not yet certified for aviation use. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, a lot of the change to jet fuel alternatives is going to require significant investment in infrastructure, new aircraft and production processes, which will obviously take time and cost money. Um, Political intransigence and limited consumer appetite to date is primarily linked to the fact that these changes will cost a lot of money and it will take time to implement them. And previously, we found issues that um, aviation being a truly global business means that national priorities to do with climate become part of the equation in establishing um, global solutions. It is difficult, for example, for uh, a UK or EU government to impose regulations that apply only to its own carriers, uh, which would then face uh, significant competition from uh, foreign carriers operating the same routes who wouldn't have to apply the same um, uh, environmental targets or, or costs. So this has been a factor in delaying how um, uh, environmental policy can be implemented in an effective way. We have, though, made progress on this, and uh, the ICAO-Corsia programme 
is one of the only uh, global agreements um, that brings uh, all governments around the world, all major governments around the world, um, to the same position on um, making progress on curbing uh, aviation's environmental emissions. And that stands in contrast to any other industry, whether that is power or marine or any other industry that has uh, a global footprint. So whilst uh, Corsia is um, sometimes criticised for lacking ambition and, um, and teeth, um, we shouldn't forget that it is a um, world leading and a, a climate leading agreement that has brought a lot of disparate national views on uh, climate solutions together. Next slide, please. The, um, the scale of the problem here is um, just to put it into, uh, into context. In the UK, um, about 12 million tonnes of jet fuel is uplifted annually. And that's uh, not far off um, half the energy content of all electricity delivered to the UK grid. Globally, the figure is just under 300 million tonnes and 3.5 terawatts of power, um, significantly greater than all of the electrical power generated uh, to the EU grid in 2019. I hope that gives some context for how much energy is actually contained within jet fuel, which we'll go on to in a little bit. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> One of the challenges that uh, Logan Air faces as a regional operator is, um, well, clearly we are very obviously an airline and we have a very clear responsibility to manage and reduce our emissions. Quite often we are um, lumped in with the wider uh, aviation industry and um, domestic aviation in the UK actually only accounts for 4% of all UK aviation emissions. As this chart sort of shows, um, over a third of all UK aviation emissions comes from flights over two and a half thousand kilometres. And once you go beyond 500 kilometres, you can see that uh, it's the medium and longer haul flights that we really need to find a solution to if we're going to fundamentally reduce emissions from UK, the UK aviation sector. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, something that is often also missed um, is uh, in the discussion about aviation and uh, climate emissions is that um, our domestic aviation industry across the whole of the UK um, actually emits less carbon than our railway network. Um, now, clearly the two things aren't immediately comparable. The railway network serves other purposes and moves uh, large numbers of people often over shorter distances but it mustn't be um, overestimated either in terms of its climate credentials um, for example less than 40 percent of the uk's uh, rail network is actually electrified and once you move outside of the higher density commuter routes in the south of england which move millions of people commuting into london on electrified networks um, quite often we're looking at quite old heavy rolling stock that is diesel burning um, and operating at quite low load factors. I want to make clear that, that Logan Air are not arguing um, against rail or ferries or other transport modes. In fact, we very much believe that when we come to talk about emissions and transport solutions, we have to look at the, the network as a whole. Um, aircraft can't do the same job that, that railways or ferries do. Um, we need all of these um, parts of the transport system to work together to provide an effective national transport system. Um, but that does mean looking at the system as a whole rather than individual parts of it. Um, the uh, other point that this sort of chart tends to try and make is um, just at how significant the issue of road uh, emissions are. In total, if you combine cars, taxis, HGVs, um, we're talking nearly 10 times the amount of emissions come from road vehicles as do from domestic aviation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this chart really sort of explains the um, problem that we face in decarbonizing uh, aviation. Jet fuel is fundamentally a highly efficient energy store. Um, one kilogram of jet fuel 
takes up the volume of about 1.25 litres, and it contains approximately 12 kilowatt hours of electrical energy. Um, the, uh, the, the price of jet fuel moves quite rapidly. Um, at the minute, I think that's closer to $600 a tonne, but um, that broadly um, gives you an idea of um, the uh, efficiency of the fuel when you compare it to the next um, column along, the lithium ion battery, which um, is the type of battery that is being used and considered for future aviation battery electric solutions. To achieve the same amount of energy, um, with current technologies, um, we require an energy with a mass almost 40 times greater. But also what shouldn't be underestimated is the volumetric space required. And again, a battery often takes up 20 times the space uh, of the equivalent amount of jet fuel. Um, moving along then, if we look at hydrogen, we find that uh, gaseous hydrogen, so GH2, uh, pressurized to around 700 bar, which is 10,000 uh, PSI, um, is significantly more energy dense than jet fuel, um, almost three times the um, energy density of jet fuel. However, even when pressurized to such high levels, uh, it still takes up almost 10 times the volume um, of space. And what inevitably happens as we put these kind of systems into uh, aircraft or vehicle contexts is that the mass of the tank system to handle these high pressures uh, and still demonstrate um, acceptable crash worthiness um, often means that the um, mass benefit of the fuel is outweighed by the increased mass of the tank system. Moving further off to the right, if we liquefy the hydrogen, um, we achieve a further improvement in the volumetric density of the fuel. Um, but we need to chill the fuel to minus 253 degrees centigrade, which is a significantly um, it's a significant energy cost and obviously requires um, quite a lot more challenging uh, logistics handling and on aircraft uh, fuel systems to be able to maintain the fuel at that temperature. But that reduces the, the volume uh, required down to about um, five litres per uh, 12 kilowatts of energy. Next slide, please. So um, that was a brief introduction to what the potential solutions to um, aviation's uh, carbon emissions problems are. And we'll go through these in a little bit more detail. The first one, um, which is battery electric um, solutions followed by hydrogen fuels and sustainable aviation fuels, which are a form of um, biofuel based uh, systems and um, offsetting solutions will be part of the mix for aviation generally as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, Logan Air is uh, heavily involved in a number of different uh, future flight uh, challenges. Um, these are UK government funded projects via um, an organization called Innovate UK and uh, UKRI. And we are partnering with a number of um, innovative techn technology providers, um, several of which have uh, links to Orkney, as you may have picked up in the press. Um, the most important one here is Project SATE, which stands for Sustainable Aviation Test Environment. It's being led by Highlands and Islands Airports Limited, and it is centered around Kirkwall, where the intention is to make use of the um, airspace and infrastructure to establish a test environment that um, permits the development of these new technologies, whether they be unmanned aircraft, um, clean fuel systems, or smaller manned aircraft. Um, Kirkwall is a, an ideal location on which to um, base and test these kind of vehicles. We also work on Project 20, which is led by Ampere, who we'll talk about a little bit later, who work on battery hybrid solutions, and also Project Heart, which is looking more around hydrogen-based solutions. Uh, Logan Air are also part partners uh, on Project Fresson, which is led by Cranford Aerospace, and this project is looking to develop a hydrogen conversion of the Britain Norman Island aircraft. Next slide, please. So battery electric aircraft, um, <clears throat> the main uh, challenges with battery electric aircraft, as we said before, is the, the mass of the battery system, which ultimately ends up limiting the aircraft's range. Um, the power to weight density, the power to weight ratio is um, 
typically 250 watt hours per kilogram um, at a pack level. Um, this is often lower than what can be achieved in a laboratory at a cell level, because of course for an aircraft, we're required to put in place um, a lot of electrical connectors and uh, protection uh, temperature management systems to ensure that the batteries remain uh, safe um, even in a fault condition. Uh, a question that's often asked is um, why doesn't uh, why don't uh, aircraft respond in the same way that electric vehicles electric cars do uh, to the adoption of battery technology? Um, there are two issues primarily it is because the the um, aircraft is far more sensitive to increases in mass than the car. Um, uh, an estimate being that the uh, for an aircraft or for a car rather, um, converting to a battery pack increases the energy requirement by about 33%, but for an aircraft it's closer to 80%. Um, but similarly, uh, uh, the car is also able to recover a lot of the uh, energy that is normally lost during the normal stop-start braking process, particularly in city driving. Um, whereas for an aircraft, the uh, aircraft systems already recover a lot of the uh, potential energy that is gained by the aircraft as it climbs up to cruise altitude. When it descends back down, uh, there's very low fuel consumption. And so the um, potential energy from the aircraft being at altitude is already very efficiently converted back to kinetic energy as it descends. However, we do believe that um, battery electric hybrid systems have a role to play. We're working with Project 2.0, as I said, with Ampere, um, and there's been a series of test flights um, of uh, Cessna 337 that they have converted. that has been flying between Wick and Kirkwall. Uh, and Logan Air's um, pilots and engineers have been involved, um, and uh, our uh, management team are also working with Ampere to help them develop their product, product in a way that would become suitable for a um, future use, particularly in Scotland. Next slide, please. This clip shows a um, reset of the work that Ampere were doing on the aircraft, the vehicle itself, which has the front engine uh, removed and converted to run on. Uh, it's essentially a, a battery uh, system is on the pod underneath the aircraft and the front engine is an electric motor. Uh, this aircraft's been tested um, uh, between Wick and Kirkwall and also uh, has done a series of demonstration flights um, in the south of the UK. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, another area of development and interest um, that is uh, becoming more prominent and more publicly uh, discussed are the use of EV tolls and e stoles. So, EV toll standing for electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. And on the top left there, you can see vertical aerospaces uh, VAX4 um, prototype. Um, the other uh, set of aircraft are e stoles or electric short takeoff and landing aircraft. And the top right aircraft there is uh, uh, Electra uh, Aero's concept, and below is Airflow's concept, both of which are closer to the nine seat range. The attraction of these types of vehicles is that with the widespread adoption of battery electric technology, or more electric technology, should we say, um, the use of multiple small electric motors. Um, allows for highly redundant um, uh, power distribution initially, but also um, some quite interesting aerodynamic concepts of blown wings and blown flaps to produce um, very short takeoff and landing capable vehicles, while still primarily using the wing to generate lift. Uh, this significantly reduces the energy demand versus an equivalent vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. Next slide, please. Um, there are over 200 new air taxi-like vehicles currently under develop, development globally. Um, the majority of them are battery powered with the advantage of having zero tailpipe emissions, but often with quite short operating ranges. Um, the economics of these vehicles are challenging. They're gonna be 
relatively expensive. The battery systems are going to be also relatively expensive. Um, and they will need to achieve very high levels of utilization um, in order to uh, be able to generate tickets at acceptable fares. Um, they are, of course, also still required to operate from licensed airfields. Um, and so they will face competition from conventional um, airliners and air transport modes. Next slide, please. Um, East Olds, we believe, have greater economic potential. Um, although there will obviously be cases where vertical takeoff and landing is uh, very effective and most appropriate. Um, the use of the runway reduces the peak power requirements and therefore for a given mass of vehicle will have a greater payload or range. Um, and the distributed electric propulsion provides numerous aerodynamic um, opportunities. Um, for example, the potential to use asymmetric power for effective low speed maneuvering, um, the ability to partially feather certain uh, props along the wing, um, or put some even into reverse power to allow you to generate very high but stable uh, rates of descent and therefore achieve um, effective short takeoff and landing performance. Next slide, please. Um, Talk then briefly a bit more about hydrogen. Um, hydrogen can be produced cleanly um, by electrolyzing water, assuming that the electrical input is generated by an additional uh, clean power source. Um, and the process creates uh, hydrogen and oxygen. As we said, hydrogen has almost three times the, the energy density of jet fuel, um, but it is challenging to handle volumetrically or temperature-wise. However, when the fuel is consumed in a fuel cell, um, the process is essentially reversed and hydrogen is combined with ambient oxygen uh, from, from the air, um, generating electricity in a fuel cell and producing water as the only emissions. There are no other nitrous oxides or other um, uh, particles emitted. So it's incredibly clean and uh, a neat closed loop. Um, within a fuel cell designed aircraft, we're also able to capture the water vapour at peak or critical periods of the flight to ensure that there are no contrail for, contrails formed as well. Um, the main advantage of hydrogen, particularly when it's uh, produced in a gaseous form um, uh, and doesn't require liquefaction in order to be used on the aircraft, is that the technology required to produce hydrogen is relatively straightforward and well understood. Um, and it's primary, the primary cost uh, factor for producing hydrogen is the cost of the green electricity that is sourced to um, produce the produce the hydrogen in the first place. And therefore there is a tremendous opportunity for Scotland and particularly for Scotland's island communities with their vast offshore wind resources to combine the uh, production of hydrogen uh, with the new uh, wind plants going in. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Logan Air works with Zero Avia, um, who flew uh, one of the first um, hydrogen powered light aircraft in 2020. And um, they are working on a project to develop and uh, convert a larger aircraft, uh, demonstrating the use of their fuel cell technology. And the graphic there just shows a simple layout of uh, the process. Next slide, please. Uh, we believe that hydrogen is the most efficient zero carbon fuel source for larger aircraft. And we believe that it has applications uh, for short and medium haul aircraft up to sort of about 180 seats. Um, and that these will be flying across the UK by, by 2040 at the latest. Um, Airbus have announced a program to um, introduce the next version of their A320 as a hydrogen powered aircraft. Um, around the mid 2030s. For aircraft up to 70 seats, which covers the, the uh, entirety of Logan Air's current fleet, hydrogen can be used in a fuel cell, which is very quiet, and as we said, very clean. Once you go above um, 70 seats, the sort of power range beyond that point, um, quite often it seems that um, consuming hydrogen in a turbine is more efficient. Um, that's part of the analysis and work that's currently going on. 
Um, the combustion of hydrogen in a turbine is less desirable because it does emit some elements of nitrous oxides and other um, emissions, but uh, fundamentally it is a uh, still, there are no CO2 emissions, which is the primary objective. Next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> sustainable aviation fuels um, are uh, currently produced by from biofuels. The typical feedstock uh, that's, that's used across Europe is used cooking oil, and, um, but other sources such as forestry waste, waste energy crops, or even um, municipal solid waste uh, can also be used as uh, fuel sources. Um, SAF does still produce CO2 emissions when it's combusted on the aircraft, but when the total life cycle costs of the carbon uh, are taken into account, the um, overall CO2 emissions of the fuel are something like 80% lower than the equivalent amount of jet fuel. Currently, um, <clears throat> jet fuels are permitted to use up to 50% or have a mix of 50% biofuel blended with um, mineral jet fuel. Um, and there is work ongoing to um, increase that level or increase that blend um, to uh, continue to expand the carbon benefits of this fuel. SAF is expensive to produce. It follows a classic refining process, similar to cracking crude oil, um, and consequently the fuel is expensive um, to use. Um, there is a lot of work ongoing in the UK currently to develop the SAF industry and to um, improve the uh, UK's capability to produce this fuel. Um, we expect to see a number of plants becoming live over the coming decade. Next slide, please. <clears throat> UK aims for production capacity of between two and 4%. And as we said, um, the volume of jet fuel that we need in the UK is close to 12 million tonnes. So whilst that might sound like a low percentage, it's a significant challenge to achieve. Um, the, uh, one of the areas we're working on currently is um, uh, how we can effectively deploy SAF uh, from regional airports because a significant cost uh, of the fuel is actually the logistics costs of shipping the fuel, particularly to smaller regional airfields. Uh, and the current cost of jet fuel is in the order of three to four times the cost of equivalent mineral jet fuel, which means that it is um, prohibitively expensive to operate um, as it currently stands. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> clearly, the um, availability of bio-based uh, fuel feedstocks is, is limited. Um, and as the whole industry moves towards 2050 and achieving net zero, the uh, requirement will move towards producing the bulk of um, SAF, we believe, uh, from power to liquids, which is essentially um, uh, the uh, use of uh, the, high, the, the synthetic uh, creation of a hydrocarbon liquid fuel. Um, the inputs would be primarily um, green hydrogen, processed in or produced in a, the same way as previously discussed, um, combined with direct air captured CO2 or potentially industrially captured CO2. Um, no land use issues, um, but um, the entire process is quite energy intensive and therefore we expect the fuel again to be quite expensive. It does, however, have the potential to be produced at the kind of scales that would be needed to address the global aviation uh, industry's demand. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, during this year, um, Logan Air is planning to uh, trial uh, the use of sustainable aviation fuels, um, and Kirkwall is the, the base that uh, we'll be planning to deploy the fuel from. Uh, this is under Project SATE for future flight. And part of the idea is, is really to understand the logistic costs and what is involved in getting effectively Logan Air's internal systems um, around the idea of using a different kind of fuel. We'll be trying to understand its effect on, on aircraft and engine performance, um, but we aren't expecting there to be significant differences. The uh, technology behind SAF has been well understood and matured. Um, and uh, most operators, I think, report a slight improvement in fuel burns and efficiency because the fuel has been quite highly processed. 
Um, <clears throat> we're looking to explore how we can use it in the short term um, as we wait to convert our fleet to uh, more hydrogen-based um, fuel sources. Um, but the large expense of the fuel makes that challenging. However, we are talking to Transport Scotland and, and other um, uh, service users to see how we might be able to deploy it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, offsetting and carbon capture are um, two concepts that have um, become quite contentious. Um, Logan Air announced its Green Skies initiative um, uh, earlier this year, which is our plan to offset 100% of all our emissions um, from this current year. And to do that, um, we need to use carbon offsetting. Um, these activities are uh, typically uh, involve projects uh, in the developing world, um, often to uh, plant more trees or uh, schemes which introduce renewable power, displacing coal or other fossil fuel power production. Um, we accept it as being um, less desirable than direct CO2 um, reductions. And so it's a short term measure as we wait for the technologies that we believe will be the future fuels uh, become developed and online. Currently, there aren't any immediate solutions available for the aviation industry. So offsetting is a means to um, progress towards that. Next slide, please. Carbon capture and storage is a more direct carbon removal method. Um, it involves the mechanical removal of carbon dioxide from the air and uh, then subsequently the, the um, gas being compressed and pumped underground. Um, this is highly relevant for Scotland, given that there is extensive uh, offshore oil and gas infrastructure and expertise, um, and the St Fergus Gas Terminal Project, which some may be aware, uh, north of Aberdeen, is um, looking to utilise a lot of the existing uh, North Sea gas infrastructure and essentially run it in reverse, um, where we have pipelines going out to depleted gas fields. The plan is to capture carbon on on, on the uh, on land and pump it back out to these under, underground storage facilities. Um, we think this is going to be an important part of how the aviation industry meets its overall targets, um, but also very important for um, the country as a whole to uh, meet its uh, climate targets. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned before, Logan Air's Green Skies Initiative is um, our ambition to become carbon neutral by 2040. Um, we hope and aim to become the first commercial airline to operate a zero emissions flight um, this decade. Um, and when we do, it will most likely be the Britain Norman Islander fleet that is converted and operated from Orkney based at Kirkwall. Um, we assume that our fleet will transition to primarily hydrogen powered aircraft during the 2030s. And we forecast that by the end of the 2040s or by 2040, excuse me, um, the majority of our scope one emissions um, will have been reduced directly through conversion to hydrogen and that less than 10% of our current emissions will still be um, or will still be from aircraft fuels. Um, in the interim and until sustainable zero emission aircraft are certified, um, we will offset the emissions with certified internationally recognized carbon offsets. Next slide, please. Uh, this, these next few graphs just simply summarize um, how we envisage that the industry and Logan Air in particular will be able to convert to a uh, net zero future. Um, as we've covered, um, we've been testing battery electric and hydrogen aircraft. We expect to introduce um, hydrogen, although it may well also be battery electric hybrid. The um, development work on these aircraft is still ongoing, um, probably around the mid 2020s. And uh, in parallel to that, our Saab 340 fleet is steadily being replaced by uh, the more modern ATR-42 and 72 aircraft, um, despite the fact that these aircraft are larger, um, being uh, systemically more, more modern, 
um, the fuel intensity per passenger carried is significantly lower. Less. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, towards the end of this decade, um, we expect to see larger aircraft uh, becoming commercially available, um, probably using hydrogen uh, fuel systems. And our ambition is that our twin otter fleets will again be amongst the first in the world to be converted to operate on this sort of technology. Um, we expect St Fergus to come online in this period, and we will be very much supporting them and looking at how we can work with them to uh, directly abate some of our CO2 via their systems. Um, we also expect that in this period, um, the, the availability of SAF will have increased. Um, and as the costs reduce, we will constantly evaluate the opportunities to deploy SAF across our fleet. And we're also encouraging both the Scottish and UK government to develop um, more uh, locally based programmes that are certified to international standards so that we can invest some of the revenues that we collect um, towards our offsetting programme uh, more locally. And we're particularly interested in schemes that will improve the diversity of wildlife rather than uh, perhaps just planting um, large numbers of trees. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and the final period, which is where we expect the majority of change to occur, is that at this point, hydrogen propulsion systems, whether they be fuel cells or turbines, um, will become available and applicable for larger aircraft. Um, and that's, this is the time frame at which we expect the majority of Logan Air's fleet to be converted. Obviously, this requires a lot of infrastructure to be um, upgraded and improved and developed, which um, we're waiting for. Um, and at this point, um, offsetting, we would expect, would largely have been retired um, and carbon capture and storage and SAF um, primarily cover the balance of CO2 that's required. Um, this is a, our ambition. Um, we're requiring a lot of technology to be developed and continue on its pathway and become certified. Um, it's important to note that at this point, there aren't any battery electric or hydrogen powered aircraft available for commercial use, none have yet been certified. And that process will take several years. It's a big change for the industry and we need to establish and assure ourselves that um, uh, these systems can be made to work safely on commercial aircraft. But we are confident with what we've seen and optimistic that these systems will become available in the future. I think that concludes the presentation. Well, you've certainly given a lot of fascinating detail, Andy, and stimulated a, a number of questions. One question coming in is about the market. You mentioned at the start that Logan Air is thankfully getting back soon to full capacity after the pandemic or what we hope is the, the end of the pandemic. But that does lead to the question that during the pandemic, of course, we've not been traveling and we've been communicating online. Do you think that the travel market, the, in particular, the aviation travel market will recover? And could that be a, an unknown in future plannings? Um. <clears throat> It's, it's a good question. Um, clearly, um, remote working has become a lot more established than it was two years ago, and that will inevitably impact um, uh, uh, customers' travel requirements and, and demand. Um, we are seeing um, travel uh, patterns um, recover sort of as we'd expected. Um, I think we are likely to see more hybrid working in future. Um, but at this point, we're not seeing any um, seismic shifts in, in patterns of demand. And of course, in many cases, you often need a minimum level of service on a given number of routes. For example, the ability to go out somewhere in the morning and return the same day is, is one of the um, attractiveness of, of, of um, flying to, to attend meetings or other appointments. And that level of capacity is unlikely to, to reduce significantly. So it's not, a, it's not been a significant um, part of our, our planning concerns for future years, but we just don't know. We'll just have to see how demand does recover once we do fully um, get through this, this COVID phase. <clears throat> 
And I guess that's one of the strengths of your being a, a re, an airliner with a, with a lot of regional routes, because you'll have many people who simply just have to travel. Well, for instance, you'd have people traveling between Kirkwall and Aberdeen for hospital appointments and medical reasons. So quite a lot of your travel will be essential travelers. That, that's right. I mean, the, and it's quite different in Scotland than perhaps in other parts of the UK. Um, which is often difficult for other parts of the UK to understand where, you know, high speed mail rail does run up and down the east and west coasts. And, and there are um, other um, viable transport alternatives. Um, but we've adapted our network as we've seen um, demand change um, and um, we will continue to, to do so. One question has come in about the, the choice of hydrogen. Pentland 284 asks had you considered ammonia as an alternative or is it is is it definitely commitment to hydrogen um so the the there's my understanding and, and I'm, I'm not a chemist so i'm uh, i apologize if i get this wrong but um my understanding is that the predominantly the the energy content in ammonia actually comes from from the hydrogen and there has been a lot of work looking at um uh, what we call LOCs or liquid organic carriers, where we look at alternative um, uh, chemical compositions such as ammonia that um, have better volumetric uh, or density properties to allow us to transport hydrogen uh, more efficiently. Um, so ammonia um, does allow us to convert equivalent amount, amounts of hydrogen in a far smaller volume. The challenge though, as I understand it, is, is finding fuel cells that will run on pure ammonia um, without having to go through quite an energy intensive conversion process to get back at the hydrogen. Um, I believe one of the other issues with, with ammonia is, is the nitrogen content and so the risk of uh, producing nitrogen oxides and things. But it's certainly something that is being looked at quite heavily um, most of the uh, aerospace engineers that I've spoken to on this are sort of suggesting that actually hydrogen in its purest form is, despite its um, handicaps, is actually still the most efficient uh, fuel source. But it's certainly being looked at and, and it may well be that to move large volumes of hydrogen um, across the globe, for example, um, that converting it to, to ammonia or something similar and transporting it in that form is significantly cheaper and easier to do. And it's very impressive your time scale with I think it's 2024 or 2025, a, a fully hydrogen powered airliner. It, that's the plan to, to come into Kirkwell. And um, one question about that is what's that dependent on? You'd be very dependent on the plane makers, on the, the hydrogen producers. I just wondered where the, the kind of critical areas that you're dependent on would be. Yes. So, the, and, and you're right, the two key critical areas are the development of the aircraft. And um, this, the, the, there, are, there are a number of different routes, but the, the one I'm thinking of in particular is uh, Project Fresen with Cranford Aerospace. They recently took delivery of uh, Britain Norman Islander, which they're going to start converting. Um, but there's a lot of work to do and a lot of certification work to do. Um, so those timescales are primarily driven by the availability and the ability of the um, aircraft manufacturer. Um, Britain Norman are a partner uh, on Project Fresen, but it's primarily driven by the ability of Cranford Aerospace and Britain Norman to physically convert the aircraft and certify it. Um, the other strand, as you mentioned, is, is infrastructure. Now, one of the reasons why we're so positive about this and think that uh, Kirkwall is the obvious location to, to deploy this technology is the presence of EMEC um, and its uh, hydrogen electrolyzers on, on E-Day and the significant amount of institutional expertise that has been built up in Orkney to um, handle and produce hydrogen. And that gives us confidence that that other side of the equation, the production storage and um, delivery of hydrogen to, to Kirkwall Airport is something that we can manage. Um, we're bidding in, in phase three for some more work to see whether we can continue to expand that hydrogen production in Orkney and keep it relevant for aviation. Um, but yes, there's quite a lot to be done and there's quite a lot of, of risk. Um, but we're confident that um, everyone is pointing in the right direction. <laughs> 
And it's interesting to think that so often in transport, Orkney might feel the end of the line. New developments start in the big urban areas and gradually trickle down northwards. It seems that in this area of technology, it's the other way around. I'd agree, absolutely. Um, and um, as we've introduced um, technology partners from around the world and, and from the south of the UK, they've all walked away really impressed with the capabilities that exist up in Orkney, but also I think the um, the general attitude of, of the population and the council and the various other uh, stakeholders involved and the, the seriousness with which um, we're addressing the climate uh, crisis, um, but the very practical steps people are taking um, to, to make change now. And uh, that's left a big impression, I know, on, on many of the um, new visitors to, to Orkney who have been um, struck by that. Is that a feeling that you get really better through the aviation industry, through the technology company you deal with, the government agencies you deal with, that there is now a real sense of urgency that something has to be done and fast? Yes, I think the, the industry um, has changed significantly in the last, I would suggest, three years. Um, and the climate impacts of aviation are now central to how airlines boards think about their businesses and the future. Um, and I think the industry generally recognizes that um, it can't afford to be um, the laggard. It can't afford to be the last uh, big emitting industry not to address its emissions. The, the challenge of course, is that the technical solutions for aviation are a way away they're not here now and they are going to be very expensive to transition to that's the challenge um but in terms of the desire and the intent i would say that that has um along very significantly and quickly and for the technical solution do you feel that sufficient resources are committed is there a need for additional private sector funding additional government sector funding or do you feel that the people are there the technology researchers that the equipment is there to make it happen in the desired time scale um we've been quite impressed with the level of both government and private support for these technologies um it's one of those things that it needs to be maintained. That's often the challenge as uh, certainly uh, the UK government comes under ever increasing funding pressure going into the next few years. Um, it needs to be sustained over the next three to five years to um, ensure that this technology doesn't stall. Um, uh, but overall, I'd say the, the level of investment has been impressive. Um, I would need to ask the technology providers whether if, if they were, as it were, sprayed with more money, they could move quicker. Um, it might be that, that the answer to that is yes. But fundamentally, I think the um, core technologies are um, being appropriately moved forward and that uh, the issue is as much one of um, understanding and, and adapting regulation in a way that uh, maintains safety, um, but um, permits new technologies to, to be deployed. A question from Ian Hutchison, who asks, how do your Embraer, I hope I've pronounced that right, by the way, Embraer jet fleet fit into the, the programme? Yes, yeah, so um, that's uh, an open question at the minute. Um, the, the, we expect that the first uh, hydrogen um, hydrogen powered, uh, let's say, major airlines owners of the 50 seats and above, um, will be more likely turboprop rather than jet-powered aircraft. Um, but there is a lot of work ongoing on hydrogen turbines. Um, in fact, I think, I think Frank Whittle's initial uh, prototype jet engine was actually uh, consumed hydrogen. I, I may be wrong on that. Maybe some of your uh, aviation experts here will, will, will correct me. But um, hydrogen uh, is very compatible with conventional turbine technology. As I understand it, the main issue is that the combustion uh, chamber runs significantly hotter with, with hydrogen, but essentially it's a very compatible fuel with, with turbine technology. So um, we do expect hydrogen turbofan uh, jet aircraft to also uh, become available and uh, 
Um, again, as the technology is developed and scales up, it will probably start with the smaller aircraft, of which the Embraer 135s and 145s amongst the smallest um, jets and servers. So whether they're replaced with, with turboprop type aircraft or um, other small or slightly larger jet aircraft uh, remains to be seen, but we're confident that um, both types of aircraft will be available um, for use during the 2030s. And just uh, one final question, you've come through something like 18 months of the worst pandemic, surely for several generations. You've got this massive challenge of climate change in which the aviation industry is really in the, in the front line. Overall, though, do you feel a degree of optimism about the future? Yes, I do. Um, and, and you're right, the challenges when you, when you set them out like that are, are quite stark. Um, but um, what I am seeing in aviation for the first time, I think, in, in my lifetime is a revolutionary change rather than evolutionary change, um, both in terms of uh, operators' mindsets and policies, but also in the um, uh, aircraft manufacturers. This is the first time that we've had the opportunity to embrace a completely new fuel technology, um, and it presents a number of opportunities as well as risks. Um, and I think those opportunities are, are quite significant, um, potentially allowing us to um, lower the costs of operating some of these very small aircraft, um, where we traditionally we have diseconomies of scale because they are small. Um, and if we can do that, it, it actually offers the potential to open up new routes and um, uh, provide higher frequencies and just a more attractive service that could have a real benefit for both operators and consumers as well. So, uh, yes, despite the challenges, I'm, I'm optimistic that um, uh, certainly the smaller regional airline aircraft like uh, Logan Air will be able to convert to truly um, zero emission fuels and that the wider industry also through the use of SAF and other technologies will also be able to improve its carbon performance. Thank you very much indeed for sharing so much fascinating inside information about the, the way the airline see the future. Thanks too to the technical team behind the scenes. Thanks to everyone viewing and sending in questions. We'll be back with more from the Aviation Festival at six o'clock when we move to the future of Logan Air's much appreciated aircraft, the Britain Norman Islander. We'll hear from a director of Britain Norman as to what lies ahead. In the meantime, from us all, goodbye for now. Thank you.